Hello and welcome back. This is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Jumping into this, this will be a tabletop review and comparison of the HK91 and the PTR91. We will start off with a general historical overview talking about these two rifles and then we will move through a point by point comparison of the two and also at the end talk about different accessory options on the market. If that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up right now. Alright, let's go ahead and jump into this starting off with the history. The story begins in 1958 when the Spanish Setney was accepted into service in the Spanish military. It was designed by Ludwig Volgrimler, who was a German engineer and arms designer. HK of Germany had worked on design changes with the Setney, which produced the Setney Model B. It was slated to go into development with the German army, but in 1956, the German Bundesgrundschütze canceled further development in favor of the FNFAL, which went into service as the German G1. However, the newly formed West German Army, the Bundeswehr, wanted to resume testing on the Setme, which they referred to as the Automatic Gewehr 3, or the Automatic Rifle 3, or simply the G3. It went into testing against the SIG SG510 and the American AR-10 to replace the G1. In 1959, the West German Army officially adopted the G3. Changes were made during its service life, giving it the updated drum sights, flash suppressor, and synthetic furniture. This variation became known as the G3A3. Also, a model with a collapsible stock, just like the one we see here, was adopted known as the G3A4. A semi-automatic export model was produced known as the HK41, which did go through some variations, ending up with the HK91. They were imported into the U.S. between 1974 and 1989 when an executive order was passed by George Bush Sr that banned further importation of the rifle. Only 49,000 made it into the country. JLD Enterprises then began using the tooling and began production on a ban compliant HK-91 clone in 2002. When the Clinton assault weapons ban ended in 2004, JLD then began making other HK clones and configurations that we know today. In 2005, JLD was purchased by PTR Industries, which continued manufacturing of what we know today as the PTR-91. All right, jumping into these, let's go ahead and start with the overall specifications. Starting up here with the HK91, it does have an overall length of 40.38 inches, a barrel length of 17.71 inches, and an overall weight of 9.7 pounds. The PTR91 does have an overall length of 40.5 inches, a barrel length of 18 inches, and an overall weight of 9.5 pounds. The PTR-91 is in the G3A3 configuration with the fixed full-length stock and uh, polymer handguard, of course. And um, up here, the HK-91 is in the G3A4 configuration, which does feature the collapsible stock. Now, in this comparison, the HK-91 is very highly regarded as a collectible rifle, as they are no longer imported into the country and have not been since 1989. They are pretty uncommon and hard to come by. So during this uh, comparison, I will talk about some of the uh, collectible features, uh, some of the changes that were made uh, during the production of these. A lot of things have been switched around and changed as they've moved from owner to owner. So some things that you can probably look for when you're identifying a HK91 in terms of collectability. That being said, the A4, the collapsible stock configuration, is a little bit more desirable as these were man manufactured and brought into the country and both the uh, A3 and the A4 configuration, fewer in the A4 configuration did come into the market. Now, you can purchase original G3 collapsible stocks like this one for about two to $300 and you can switch them onto your gun. You can also switch those over to your PTR-91 if you uh, are able to find one of these stocks and you like that look and feel, you can purchase them. Like I said, two to 300 bucks and stick them on there. Now, the PTR-91 GI can be found in about the $800 to $1,000 range. The HK-91 by itself, not including any accessories or anything, in today's market, depending on condition, are going anywhere from about $2,000 to $3,000, maybe up to $3,500. So um, keep that in mind, too. That is strictly because of its collectability, not because it's any better of a rifle than the PTR-91. All right, now jumping into the barrels, we'll go ahead and start down here with the PTR. It does have a match grade HK profile tapered barrel with a fluted chamber. Now, per PTR's webpage, the thread pitch is 15 by one right hand threads. 
Um, there was some speculation that that was older thread pitching, and now they use the 5 base by 24. Still today, though, on the GI model, it's listed as 15 by 1, so I'm going to go with that. I haven't tried to take this off to check. This does use a 1 in 10 right-hand twist barrel. The HK91 also has an 18 inch or a 17.71 inch barrel and does use 15 by 1 right hand thread pitch, same as the G3. The rifling is a 4 groove right hand 1 in 12 twist, same as the G3. The PTR91 does use a birdcage flash hider with 6 vent holes. Uh, you will see some flats back here for gripping onto with a wrench for those quick uh, muzzle device changes. The HK91 also uses a 6 vent birdcage flash hider, uh, just like what you're going to see on the G3, and it does have a little clamp uh, here on the side of the flash hider to keep it secure during shooting. Coming up here into the sights, this is the HK91. Uh, it does have a rounded front sight hood. It is not adjustable for windage. It's actually adjusted towards the rear uh, on the drum sight for windage changes. And you just have a fixed post up here. Of course, the PTR-91 is exactly the same. So getting down here into the handguard, starting with the PTR-91, it does use the thin G3 style uh, handguard, and this is a surplus HK part. Uh, if you go look at our other video of the HK-91 versus the C-308, I brought in that furniture close, you could see you are going to see some little, you might see some nicks and scrapes and abrasions in the furniture, even on a brand new gun. That's totally normal because it is surplus furniture. Per PTR, these do rate in at NRA very good to excellent condition, so they're not going to show up all trashed and ratty looking or anything. On the HK91, the style of handguard is different. It has more of the triangular look, and it does have these little grooves in here on either side. Uh, that is to allow the legs of a bipod to sit in there, which I will show you a little bit more later. Now both of these are heat shielded. The handguard itself on the HK91 is quite a bit heavier than on the PTR91. To remove the handguard, all you do is there is a push pin that does come out. And there is a little captive spring there, very indicative of most HK products you see on MP5s or anything else. With that removed, you can just go ahead and push the handguard down from the front. And then inside here, you can see the heat shielding, very lightweight. This is the caulking tube, so a lot of people get this confused thinking that this is a gas tube. It is not a uh, piston-driven firearm. It is, uh, it is a blowback, basically a roller locking delayed blowback system. So this is here just for caulking purposes. And then of course underneath you see the rest of the profile of the barrel. I can go ahead and remove the cross pin the exact same way on the HK91. This one is a little bit tighter. Go ahead and pulling that out of the way of course you can see uh, the heat shielding in here as well and this is quite a bit heavier it's not substantially different but you can notice a definite feeling and then of course the profile there to show you as well the changes and then if I want to I can stick the thin profile handguard here and the larger one down here they will both work just fine also this is one difference you might see on pretty much most uh, PTRs or HKs. This is a little hanger. This basically guides your cross pin through. On some semi rifles, like on the Century C308, you will not find that little clip there. So that's just one small difference to keep in mind. All right, getting into the receivers, we're going to, just like much of the rest of the rifle, we're going to see a lot of similarities between the two. The receivers are made from stamped and rolled steel, and then the seams are welded. Both of these, the finishing process is really nice. Uh, PTR Industries did do a really good job of emulating a lot of the craftsmanship and detail when assembling these rifles. Like I mentioned in the historical overview, these are built actually on HK tooling. So they are built on the same machines, not copies of the machines, but the exact same machines the original HK91s and G3s were built on. So you're going to see a lot of the same quality and a pattern in the parts. That's why all the parts are interchangeable. Finish-wise, the PTR-91 GI does use a military-style parkerizing. Now, getting into the finish on the HK-91, there were basically two finish variations. On the earlier HK-91s, uh, up until about 1981 or 82, they did use the, it's kind of a grayish blue. It's not so much of a military-style finish. Um, they really switched it over. It's not the same finish that they used on the original German G3. They put kind of this bluish gray finish on it just for their commercial exports. 
to kind of give it probably more of a sportsman's look to it, make it look a little bit nicer and less like a crude military rifle. That's just speculation on my part, of course. Now, earlier up until, again, 1979, I believe these, these were imported by Seiko. This is a Seiko import HK91. This was made in 1977. So, of course, the HK91s were made in Germany and then they were imported into the United States by Seiko. In 1982 is when I believe the year was uh, HK did open a plant, HK USA in Arlington, and then, you know, for the HK-91 rifles produced after, again, I believe it was 1981. Uh, they are not going to be Seiko imports anymore at that time. There was some transitional layover, I believe, up until 1982, you would still see Seikos. But by the end of 1982, they were pretty much all just stamped uh, the HK-91, Arlington, uh, you know, HK. So then around that time, they also switched the finish from the blue-gray to the more black color, which gave it more of a military-type look. Um, in terms of collectability, you don't really see a huge price difference when you're looking at um, an earlier Seiko import versus a non-import HK, uh, you know, when they brought in the HKs themselves, uh, or I'm sorry, when they brought the HK-91s themselves in through their uh, Arlington plant. Uh, again, you don't really see pricing variations there. Also in the color, you don't really see pricing variations there either. But if you're looking at an earlier Seiko import with an has really dark dull finish on it, then you know that it was a refinished job. Talking about the safety selectors as well, um, looking at this, you do see a two position safety selector here on the HK91, but a three position here on the PTR91. The feel on the safety selector is very much the same, uh, actually identical. The layout, the build, and everything of the safety selector is identical. Uh, S and F, of course, this is a semi automatic export model from HK, so you just see the S and F. So the S and F on the safety selector is part, it's an, those are the earlier designations, of course, for the different fire selector modes. In 1981, they did change that to a zero and a one. And I say around 1981, a lot of these parts were used sporadically. HK was not so concerned about having specific cutoff dates. So again, around 1981, you did see a change to the zero and the one. If you find or you're looking at a later HK-91 and uh, you see it's made in like 1985 or whatever and it has an S and an F, don't be so concerned. It could just mean that they used older parts, but generally you're going to see that change there. Now down here on the PTR-91, you do see the S, E, and F, and I'll bring that in a little bit closer in case you can't see that. So S, E, and F. My best guess is S is for safe, E is Einzelfeuer, which means single shot, and F means Feuer, which is uh, my awful German for full, fully automatic. Now, of course, in both the E and the F setting, you're just going to be getting semi-automatic single shots, but I imagine the reason they put that on there is because this is purely a G3 clone, and the original G3 rifle, the battle rifle, would have had that configuration on their fire selector modes. So let's go ahead and talk about the triggers then. Um, of course, being that these are both direct copies of the G3. Both of them are military triggers. They're very much the same. Now, one thing and I'll show you when we get into disassembly, the uh, safety lever will double as a cross pin that holds the trigger group in place. The trigger groups are easily removable. Uh, and then of course you just have the trigger group housing, which is just stamped metal around it. So that's uh, just kind of an interesting facet of the design. The trigger formation and structure is again, very much the same, almost identical. And we are going to see it about five and a half to six and a half pounds. I'll go ahead and bring these in one at a time and show you what the trigger pull and reset looks like. So starting here with the HK91, um, bringing this in, I'm kind of at an awkward angle here, so forgive me if I'm a little bit out of frame. I'm trying to watch this through the viewfinder. But anyway, I uh, when you start to pull, you do have a little bit of a little bit of take up, a little bit of pull here, and then you hit that wall right there. From that point, it's just a nice pull and break. Very nice trigger. Now to reset and to cock the handgun, or I'm sorry, the long gun, I'll show you this all together. So this is your charging handle here. So I know you're looking at this upside down right now. This is that awkward angle I was telling you about. So you pull that out, that just kind of disengages the bolt slightly from the fluted chamber. And then you can go ahead and pull this to the rear. And then it pulls up and holds itself in this charging handle notch. Then to release the bolt after uh, you've inserted a full loaded magazine, you can just push this down and that allows it to slam forward. Now that my trigger is reset, I'll go ahead and show you what the reset looks like. 
So you start to release and I can feel it about to reset right there and boom, reset. Again, a little bit of take up there in the initial pull with a nice clean break. PTR91 is going to be much the same. So you just have a little bit of take up there, just like on the HK91. Pull through to a very nice clean break, almost identical trigger. Go ahead and pull this back up if, if you want to lock it and down to release. And just to show you the reset, we'll go ahead and start releasing and boom, reset. Very nice and smooth reset to a gentle take up there and to a nice clean break. And that's it. Now, getting into the magazine release here on the HK91, you do have a push button release, which is a little bit in an awkward position. So anybody, unless you have very, very long fingers, uh, if you're in a natural shooting position, you will probably not be able to reach up without breaking your grip and rolling your uh, finger over or what some people do, I guess, push in with your thumb. But you are going to have to break your grip to get that magazine out. On the PTR-91, however, uh, we do have that button and a little paddle magazine release as well. So when I reach up here to grab the mag, I can push in with that paddle and then rock the magazine out from the rear. Now, traditionally, these do use a 20 round detachable box magazine, usually made out of uh, stamped aluminum. The good thing about both of these is the magazines are very cheap. You can usually find a magazine anywhere from about five to $10 on the market. Um, both of these are surplus G3 magazines. Pistol grips as well, both of these are identical. They are surplus HK parts. Of course, we have the standard black and then the uh, GI jungle green, if you will, on this one here. All you need to do to replace those is remove this screw. Grip slides right off. You can replace it with any other of your uh, favorite style. Now, moving into the sights, this is one upgrade on the G3A4, which we're gonna see on both of these patterns. This is the dioptic drum uh, rotating side base here. So you do see this drum up on top, and each one of these sight settings does reach out to an additional 100 meters. So right here on the 100 meter sight setting, you do see a little V-notch cut there. That is for 100 meters, or their point blank range, I guess is what they call it. You can then flip this drum over to 200 meters, to 300 meters and then again to 400 meters. Now on the PTR-91, I do have the windage adjustment knob. And here on the HK-91 uh, sight base, I do not have that, but I do have the same drum sights. Now moving back into the rear, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this is the A3 configuration with the full stock. This is the A4 with the collapsible stock. Starting up here, you do see these little holes in the end of the stock. That is to retain your two cross pins, which you will remove to take off the butt stock, which I'll show you here in a minute. The sling mounting point is this little crossbar and a notch, so you will thread your sling underneath this bar, and there is a keeper at the end to keep it in place. On the A4 collapsible stock variation, you do have usually what's called the meat pulverizer or a meat tenderizer, and it's exactly what it looks like. It's not the most comfortable thing. Very sharp edges on the back. Now, you will notice on all HK91 variants, even like the Century C308s, you are gonna see these channels cut into the side of the receiver. So anything you see with those channels cut can accept a collapsible stock, which is virtually all of them on the Setme or the G3 or HK91, PTR91 pattern. You will see a little triangular lever here I can push down that unlocks my stock. So while pushing that, I can then collapse and push the stock in until it locks itself in place. And then that is fully collapsed, giving a much shorter package, which of course was handier for airborne troops. Also for vehicle operators, tank drivers, that sort of thing. Here on this side as well is the sling mounting point as well. It's just a little welded bar. Now I'm gonna go ahead and show you the disassembly of the rifle. I'm gonna go ahead and start off with the PTR-91. So go ahead and remove our magazine and I have already checked and we are clear. So back here in the rear, the, there are these two cross pins, kind of like we saw up at the front uh, handguard section. So I just need to simply push on those and then grab and pull them out from the opposite side. And then if I want to, I can go ahead and use those little holes there and stick my cross pins in there to keep them in place for the time being. This was again done to like, if this had to be done in the field, it's a way to retain those cross pens so you wouldn't lose them if you're sitting out in the grass or the dark or the rain. And uh, because if you do lose those, that's not gonna stay on and it will come loose during firing and will render your rifle inoperable. So that was really important to keep track of. We'll go ahead and slide off the back end. Now, of course, in here, this is your guide rod and recoil spring. So that is all affixed to the buffer plate here in the back as well, or with the buffer plate in the back as well. 
I can go ahead and grab the trigger group housing and then rotate it down and off. So this is what I was mentioning before. The safety lever can be rotated in the all the way vertical position and then drift it out. And then with that out, you can go ahead and grab your trigger group and go ahead and pull it straight out the top. And that just leaves your empty uh, trigger group housing shell there for you. Now, one point of difference and one thing to note is on a semi-automatic version, you do have a flat shelf here. On the original G3s and Setmes, there were two little wings here with a uh, pin a hole through it. And it was actually, instead of this sitting on here, basically just resting with nothing holding it in place, the original ones did have a uh, little pin hole through the side here where you could push in a uh, cross pin much like we saw in the other parts to hold it in place. They removed that for some reason during importation it was a requirement that it made it too similar to the machine gun versions or too easy to switch out fully automatic trigger groups and into the rifle something like that so they had to make that alteration. With the trigger group removed I can go ahead and grab the charging handle and unlock it and pull it to the rear which will allow my bolt to then kind of free out the back. Now, here's the bolt head, and this is a PTR part. Yeah, so on the bolt head, on top of the bolt head, it does say PTR, so this is manufactured brand new by PTR Industries. And then the carrier itself does have this rod. That's why a lot of people think it's a gas piston gun. The rod just sits inside in here in the caulking tube area. So what happens is there's a little plunger on the caulking tube it's, uh, I'm sorry, on the cocking arm, and then that engages with the cocking tube, allowing it to cock the rifle. So that's all that's there for. It is not a, um, it's not a gas piston. So there are two little rollers here on either side of the bolt head. If you can't see that, I will bring that in. Those rollers, when the bolt head pushes in, those rollers force out and lock into recesses inside the receiver, so that keeps it engaged in place. When the gun is fired, it's direct gas blowback, so gases will come back hit the bolt and then force the bolt head to rescind into the bolt body, unlocking those uh, those uh, rollers and then freeing the rifle to reciprocate into recoil. Now moving on to the HK91, this assembly is gonna be very much the same and um, I'll go ahead and move through it quickly here so I don't bore you. So I will move those cross pins out. The retractable stock does not have any recessed locations for those cross pins, but that's not a big deal. Uh, this is really stiff, so I'll go ahead and slide that off the rear. And it comes out, again, you're going to see the exact same configuration with the um, uh, guide rod and spring, the uh, buffer here in the back, so I'll go ahead and set that aside. Other than that, the two rifles are exactly the same other than the stock. Go ahead and slide that guy out of the way, move the trigger group aside. Just like I did on the other one, I will unlock and push the bolt to the rear. Now, to show you one difference, and the reason I wanted to take that apart, is the HK bolt parts, the head and the bolt carrier, do have the codes and date on it. So here it does say HK and then a uh, little slash 75. So this bolt carrier, sorry if we're not in focus there, so this bolt carrier was made in 1975. Now, the thing about dating the rifle is if the bolt parts or any of the parts are made after what is stamped on the receiver, you know that those parts were replaced at some point. Typically what you will find is the HK91 parts will be at about the same date code, but if they are off like this one, this bolt carrier group was made two years before, about maybe a year and a half before the receiver. So it's just an excess part that was used and that's totally normal. Like I said, they weren't too anal about keeping all the parts like date code correct or anything. They just went into their parts bins and grabbed leftover parts when they were assembling these things. Uh, bolt had the same, you can't see it without rotating it, but the bolt head is dated 8 of 76. So the bolt head was made a year before the bolt, I'm sorry, the bolt was made a year before the bolt carrier and then the carrier was made a year before the rest of the gun. So still, still would be considered correct, but anywhere that's one difference I wanted to point out to you. So let's go ahead and uh, finish up with some common accessories that you can find for this platform or rifle. Starting up here uh, with one that's already installed, this is a port buffer. So what you will see is it's kind of clamps over the top of the receiver bridge and there is a rubber piece there right by the rear of the ejection port. 
Now, if, any, if you've ever seen one of these fired or fired one yourself, they do have very violent ejection. So that is there to help dampen uh, any type of damage or any of that quick uh, impacting of the casings against the side of the receiver uh, over to the rear because the uh, HK91 does not have any shell deflector or anything on it naturally. So this will act as a shell deflector uh, and also to protect the uh, the finish and everything on the rifle. The next thing we commonly see are these uh, bipods. These are actually pretty expensive parts, anywhere from about $150 to $250. Um, there are two variations. There's the complete steel variations, and then there are ones that do have polymer legs, or the feet on them are polymer. Uh, this one is all steel all the way across. The ones with the polymer feet are a little bit less valuable. I think like $50 or $75 less valuable. But anyway, to install it, what you will need is a handguard such as this. So it will not install on the thin traditional handguard that we saw on the PTR-91. So you want to make sure there are two little ridges. You want those ridges facing the back. So I'll go ahead and thread that on to this uh, little section here. Now, once I have it on partially, there is a little, and I'll switch this over, a little retaining clip here I have to push on. So I'll push on that and push it in the rest of the way. And those little ridges I mentioned before are what keep it in place from going over that little clamp. And then once that's on, it can of course set up here. You have a nice bipod you can use for more accurate shooting while you're at the range. Um, and then there's two little buttons here you can push to then fold bipod to the rear. And it sits in those little grooves that we saw in the handguard earlier, keeping it stowed out of the way while you're shooting without the bipod. Now this does add a considerable amount of weight to the front end, uh, especially with that weight that we already saw just from the handguard being a little bit bigger than the uh, traditional skinnier version on the PTR-91. Okay, moving on, we have the sling. Now the sling basic configuration is you do have a little clamp up here on the front and there is a loop right here. Um, which basically, obviously, that just clamps onto. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then the little loop on the back here, because this is the A3, this just opens up. There is a retaining pin here uh, with a ball kind of on either side with two slots in the leather that just fold over each other. So you can just put that one slot through here and it's not a lot of clearance. Fold it over and then just pop it back through that little pin and then there your sling is installed. Next thing is the bayonet. So the HK style bayonet is kind of weird. In most cases you see a bayonet go under the bottom of a barrel. This actually goes over the top. So here on the front end we just see it slide over the muzzle brake there. Then there is a little recess here in this front piece. So you just let this kind of little clamp lock into that. So I'll go ahead and slide it over, let it rest in that recess and push it in. And there it is locked in place and the bayonet is secure. So on this side of the bayonet, there is a little push button here, which I would push to then release the bayonet from the gun. And then that would allow it to come free. The next thing is the scope mounts. So there are two little claws here which will lock into recesses on the receiver bridge, bridge, which I'll show you. So what you'll do is since those are facing inwards would be in the way, we'll go ahead and lift on this lever to allow this to come up, moving those out of the way. So with those out of the way, you can go ahead and mount this over the top of the receiver bridge like this. And then you can go ahead and turn that down and then back up. You can go ahead and turn this down which will lock those uh, the little claws underneath the opposite side, which then locks the scope mount in place, then turn the arm back up to lock. And then that's how the scope mount attaches, just a claw style mount. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and take this off. You see, didn't see me put that on this way, I'll show you this way. So I can then, to release it, push on this lever, push down to move those out of the way, and then back up, and that can slide right off. Now, under here, there are little notches. These recesses here, are, I guess there are little nubs that, that pop out. Uh, that's what those claws are kind of clenching into on the underside. So because of that, you will usually see scratches and abrasions in the finish up and around that area. That's just common and unavoidable. Now, these scope mounts do tend to be a little bit pricey. Usually they're around the uh, $200 mark. 
One other thing you typically see is the carry handle. Now the carry handle mounting bracket, I don't have, but if you have that, basically you just stick this underneath that bracket, take off the hand guard, and then you slide that bracket on to the receiver right here. Um, and then your carry handle would be sitting right here. Last but not least is the issue cleaning kit. Uh, basically inside of this, you do have cleaning brushes, oil bottle, a little uh, four snake there for you too. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping in and checking this out. If you have any questions, please leave those down in the comment section for me. I try to get to as many of those as I can. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by leaving me a thumbs up or subscribing to our channel if you want to see more videos like this. Again, this is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana and CheapGunsUSA.com. You are watching Marksman TV. We will see you next time.